So I'm Joe Lochlutner. I am the tree and shrub breeder at the Morton Arboretum. Um, and so I'm giving a little bit of a talk on kind of like trees to try. Um, so I'm trying to touch a few things that might be obscure or might be kind of newer to our nurseries and our landscapes here um, as we're kind of looking for diversity. So what do I really do at the Arboretum? I work on making new plants, new cultivars of trees and shrubs. And we market those plants through a partnership called Chicago Land Grows. So Chicago Land Grows is us at the Morton Arboretum, the Chicago Botanic Garden. They have a perennial plant breeder on staff. And they're also more of the house for the marketing pathway. Um, that's kind of where the office is for Chicago Land Grows. And then we also have the Ornamental Growers Association of Northern Illinois, the wonderful folks that are hosting us tonight uh, as our third partner. So if you haven't been to our website before, you should definitely go there and check it out. And we also do these things we call plant release bulletins. So whenever we release a new plant, we print these out. We'll be at the ILCA field day um, or at iLandscape, things like that. And you can pick those up there. We, I brought a few, um, but there's a lot more available online as well. So diversity is a really trendy word, but it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around it when we're actually um, achieve it in an urbanized uh, landscape. Um, there's a lot of trees we'd like to use, but maybe they just don't want to deal with those soils. Um, or we're losing them for various reasons from our palate. So we lost uh, the American elms, we're losing the ash. Uh, what might be the big next thing? And I don't want to be like kind of one of those people that's always like down and kind of trying to scare people into using more different plants, but Asian longhorn beetle's been in Chicago and it's, uh, it's been exterminated, but it might be a matter of time before it comes back. And another thing we got to deal with is climate change. So what's, what's Illinois really going to be looking like in the future um, it really depends on who you talk to, um, kind of how skeptical they are about climate change or our carbon emissions, what changes we make in the next few years on what impact it really will have. Um, but it's pretty scary if you look at Illinois kind of within the next century migrating down to a Texas climate. So before we get deep, I just kind of want to say a few things that we need to remember when we're talking about diversity and we're talking about new plants that we're using in landscapes is that it's really important to develop a partnership with the nurseries. They're going to be the ones that are able to tell you what they actually have in the ground, what they um, can get and have available for you in the next couple of years. So if you want to try something new, talk to the nurseries, get them to get the liners and hook you up with those plants when they come to um, a diggable size. Uh, also, we're working on tree time. Whenever we talk about trees, these nurserymen, they're holding these trees sometimes five to 12 years um, in the ground if they're growing something to a larger size. It takes a long time to get these trees to market. And then if you want diversity, you also have to be willing to pay for it. Ginkgos are really slow growing. That's why they cost more money. It's rent that the tree has um, as it's growing, essentially. Um, and also, there's a learning curve for everybody. And the Arboretum, I mean, I feel like we, we're trying to position ourselves as kind of experts in uh, tree selection and tree species that do well in Illinois. So on the, your tables, everybody, you have these little booklets. Um, it kind of goes through, and it gives you a good list of plants that uh, grow in our climate. And then also it gives you information about um, where you might want to use it, performance limitations. Um, it's a pretty thorough, exhaustive list. So I figured we'd start with kind of like five problems, and with each of these problems, try to find a few solutions. Problems might be a bad word to use. Five situations. So the first one, fall color. Everybody loves fall color. But people kind of tend to fall back on the same couple of plants to achieve fall color. It's always Freeman maples or red maples. And not that they're bad. They're really good plants. They're, uh, the Freeman maples are really tough. They can take that urban situation. Um, but there's more out there. So if we're looking for red, why not try something like Nissel sylvatica, black gum, black tupelo. Um, with this one, it's kind of one of those plants where you might want to be a little bit cautious on where you're actually buying it. If you're going to be shipping it in from the south, it might be a southern provenance seed source. It might not really truly be a hardy tupelo for Chicago. So um, if you can buy it local or locally grown, that's going to be a big advantage. Um, and actually, Chicago Land Grows, we're looking at Anissa that we're going to be promoting in a few years. Like I said earlier, we're working on tree time. So we don't have them yet, uh, but Majestic is our Tupelo that we're looking at evaluating. Um, also, Ohio Buckeyes. Uh, Canton Farms has a beautiful Ohio Buckeye. There's a few other really beautiful ones out there as well. So Autumn Splendor is a tree that came out of the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Um, really great fall color, pretty good Guignardia leaf blotch resistance. And Chicago Land Grows, we're looking at another one that's called Early Glow. So Early Glow isn't on market yet, but it's coming down the pipeline. It's a Mike Yanni plant selection from up in Wisconsin, so it's a nice hardy plant. Um, good disease resistance. 
And then also, um, it actually is a really low fruit setter. So that's kind of important if you're looking at putting these things um, over sidewalks or kind of uh, parks anywhere, you don't want fruit showing up. Another one to try would be slender, or well, slender silhouettes, one of them, but uh, sweet gums. So there's a couple of cultivars that are known for being pretty good in our area, Moraine, Wurpleston, and then slender silhouettes, a tall, narrow one. Uh, one thing that I've seen a lot with sweet gums, if they're planted in a situation like this, um, along a street and along sidewalks, is they have big, chunky roots that are kind of surface growers, and they tend to lift and heave sidewalks. So that's one thing that you might not know, um, so it'd be a good thing to kind of think about where you're using them. And also, I'm a big advocate of using shrubs to get that fall color. I think that is an underutilized way to do that. Um, so we have a couple of plants that came from Chicago land grows. We have Roos coppolina, variety latifolia, Morton prairie flame. Uh, it's a beautiful sumac. It only gets to be about six feet tall. Um, it is a rhizotomous spreader, so it will colonize and form an, uh, a dense planting of sumac. Um, but it's also male. It has these beautiful yellow flowers in July. Um, but it won't set seed because it is a male. So you're not going to get off types in that planting, which is kind of important uh, with sumax. And then also we have Aronia melanocarpa Iroquois beauty, our black chokeberry that has apple-like blossoms in the spring, good fall color, um, another nice shrub. So our second problem, we lost our ash. One of the reasons I think that people really loved ash was it was a US native. It didn't have any pest or disease problems. And then on top of that, it could, you could grow it anywhere. Ash was very um, plastic and very tolerant of a lot of different growing conditions. So what could we still use to fit that niche if we're trying to look for native, tough, few pests and disease? Uh, well, Kentucky coffee tree, that's, in my opinion, the best solution. That's like the number one replacement next to ginkgos probably for ash. Um, and I know there's a lot of Kentucky coffee trees out there on the market. Um, as far as just seedling grown plants. So snatch those up if you can. I know they're, they go quickly. Um, but Chicago Land Grows, we're also looking at evaluating this upright, narrow male clone of Kentucky coffee tree that I'm really excited about. Working on tree time, 2020 probably is when we're actually going to see this plant hitting the market. Uh, another one that's a, a good, hardy U.S. native, Catalpa speciosa, the northern Catalpa. Um, I think it's tremendously underutilized uh, in landscapes. I know it's kind of got a big coarse leaf um, that can be messy. It has this fruit that can be messy, um, but it's a tough tree. Uh, another thing about it is if you look at some of the, the hybrids, um, there's this thing called Catalpa exerubescens. It's a hybrid with a oriental Catalpa, Catalpa ovata. And there are a couple that have purple leaves. So imagine that big leaf that also is purple. It's pretty cool. Um, another one of my favorites, Tilly Americana, mixed century, American century linden. Um, it's an American linden that has really good Japanese beetle resistance, really nice branching. Um, this one you guys probably already know. If you don't know it, you should know it better. Um, and then there's a couple of really unusual ones. And these might be ones that the nursery guys don't have quite yet. Um, but I know J. Frank Schmidt actually is starting to produce um, white shield uh, liners. And it's a Maclura pomifera. Um, so an Osage orange. It's male. It's thornless or almost thornless. Um, really tough tree. Uh, and another one, bald cypress, Taxodium disticum. It's a fun one. Uh, my third kind of issue or problem we might be starting to see is calorie pear. Um, people are starting to say that it might be invasive. Um, so that's something that I think we need to start working on potentially finding workable solutions. Um, so I'm working on doing breeding work right now with calorie pear, trying to make sterile forms that can come to market but it's going to be a while before we're there. So what are some other trees we could use in the meantime? My favorite crab apple is Adirondack. It's got a really uniform, upright shape, a beautiful white flower, um, really good disease resistance. That came out of the National Arboretum, and it is a fantastic plant. A couple of other really good crab apples for disease resistance, uh, Malus argentii select A, Firebirds. That was a Wisconsin selection by Mike Yanni. It's a really nice crab apple. It's on the smaller size, um, about 10, 12 feet tall, and a little bit wider uh, in maturity. And then Red Jewel is another really nice crab apple that has pretty good disease resistance and a beautiful white flower. Another one from J. Frank Schmidt that I really like is Royal Raindrops. I know that that is a grand slam um, as far as disease resistance go, and then also blending that with ornamental traits as far as having the purple foliage, a nice pink flower. Um, definitely different than a calorie pear but it's still a flowering tree that you could use in a similar situation. 
Another group of plants you could use, maybe, would be the Peking tree lilacs. Uh, we have a couple that we've released through Chicagoland Grow. So we have Morton China Snow, which has the white flower and the exfoliating amber bark that many of you are probably familiar with. But we also have Beijing Gold, which is our newer of the two tree lilacs. It's a little bit more upright and refined in habit. It's got thinner branches, um, and it just looks more like an upright egg versus kind of a spreading lilac like China Snow can be. Um, the tree lilacs, they look great as a single stem. They can also look really nice as a clump. Beijing Gold, it actually develops a really nice yellow fall color too, where a lot of the tree lilacs kind of a dingy yellow green. So something to look for. And then if you really want to step out of the box, you can go to Machia amarensis, one that's starting to become a little bit more prevalent in the nursery trade. Um, and then another one that's really not out there very much or used very often that I absolutely love is cornice moss. If you can find a tree form cornice moss, you might be able to use it in a similar situation. Another thing that I think that the Arboretum is really positioning now is a re-oaking initiative of Chicago, including street trees. We want to see more oaks being used. So two of the easiest ones that you guys all are already using are Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak, and then Quercus robur, and their hybrids, the wary eye hybrid oaks. Um, one of my favorites is Nadler Kindred Spirit. It's a very upright, tight oak, um, and it is one of those hybrids, so it doesn't get powdery mildew like the English oak does. Um, but it has that very uniform, upright shape. Uh, another oak that is really tough and works well as a street tree is shingle oak, Quercus imbricaria. Uh, and this one's in the red oak group, and it gets a little bit of a red-orange fall color, so that's pretty nice. Um, one that's pretty underutilized, in my opinion. Another one that's out there in the trade that you guys can probably source pretty easily is chinkapin oak. Um, but this one is one that you wouldn't necessarily want to use as a street tree. It needs a little bit more room for its roots. Um, so that's a, a good tip to have. If you're going to step out of your box on oaks, I think overcup, Quercus lyrata is a really nice one. And then Quercus lutina, the black oak. Um, those are going to be harder to source, but they're very nice and well adapted for urban situations. Okay. You guys, some of you are starting to look a little bit tired, so I'm going to ask you guys a question now, because we're going to go into the unusual, the things that are out there that you just might not know yet. Does anybody know what this tree is? A kind of hickory? No? A Parodia persica Persian ironwood. So it's in the Hamamalidaceae. So it's in the same family as with, uh, the witch hazels and the sweet gum. Um, so it's one of those families that we really could push for diversity. There are a lot of really nice trees in that group. So we'll get there on that one. But uh, first I wanted to point out hop hornbeam, Astraea virginica. It's a really nice tree. This one is one of them that has been kind of back and forth on really how it's going to be adapted for climate change. Some people say Astraea, oof, this is the last chance we have with it. You shouldn't be planting it anymore. But there are other models that are showing that this actually might be one of our best adapted native plants for our region, for our future. So I would say take a gamble, plant some. Um, it's a very nice tree, nice yellow fall color. Um, completely underutilized. Another one that's a really good one, Carpinus Carolinina, ironwood, might be one of the, the ironwoods that you are more familiar with. There's a lot of variability out there with those. Um, so if you want one that's good fall color, get to know your nurserymen, talk to them, go out and flag plants in the fall. Um, pretty easy to do. Uh, also, Mike Yanni has a selection of Carpinus Carolinina, fire spire. It's a nice, tight, upright plant. Um, a little bit smaller in stature, uh, but Beautiful, beautiful fall color. Um, another place I think that people can start using Carpinus that maybe they haven't yet is in bioswales. They're really tolerant of kind of being in inundated places for periods of time. It might be worth giving it a try. Um, birches, I gotta push our birches. We have beautiful birches in Chicagoland Groves. So we have Betula nigra, Little King, our Fox Valley River birch. It's a dwarf. It only gets to be about 20, 25 feet tall um, and as wide. You can limit up to show off that bark or it makes a beautiful specimen this way um, that we have it at the Arboretum. Another one of our birches is Madison White Satin. Uh, it's probably one of the most boar-resistant white bark birches out there. Um, and you can see in the picture, it's a snow white bark. It really is white bark. It's beautiful. Uh, here we have the Parodia persica again. It can develop a really nice fall color. It has that beautiful mottled bark in Hemimaladaceae, so a really good one for increasing diversity. Uh, and this is my more obscure plant, the most obscure plant probably in my talk, is uh, golden rain tree, Colruteria paniculata, a very tough tree. If you go south or you go east, you'll see a lot of it being used in urban applications. Um, beautiful yellow fall colors in July, a very nice plant. 
So I mentioned the, the books that we have earlier. And if you get those, you can flip through them. You'll find all of these plants listed inside of it. Also, we have it available online as a PDF if you go to our website. It can be a little bit hard to navigate and hard to find it. So I really suggest just Googling Northern Illinois Tree Species List, and then it'll be the first thing that pops up. Um, otherwise, if you uh, email me or our community trees office, we'd be more than happy to hook you up directly with a link. So, the Morton Arboretum, the champion of trees. <laughs>